So this is, this is an idea that we explored in a book we published uh, that I co-authored at the end of last year called The Future of the Professions. And it was a book about how technology is changing the work of doctors and lawyers and teachers and accountants and so on. And in the book, we set out two futures for the professions. Uh, the first future was, we said, reassuringly familiar. You know, it's just a more efficient version of what we have today. And here, professionals use technology, but essentially just to streamline and to optimize the traditional way in which the wave worked. And in some cases, this is the profession, so since the middle of the 16th, 17th century. And, and as you look across the professions, there's lots of examples of this. It's doctors talking to patients via Skype. It's architects using computer-assisted design software to design bigger, more complicated buildings. It's teachers using online material in the classrooms. But there's then a second future, and this is a very different proposition. And here, technology doesn't just streamline and optimize the traditional way in which these professionals have worked, but we argue it actively displaces the work of traditional professionals. What we call in the book increasingly capable systems and machines, either operating alone or, and this is quite important, designed and operated by people that look quite unlike traditional professionals. They gradually take on more and more of the tasks that are associated with traditional professionals. Now, the argument that we develop is that for now and in the medium term, these two futures will develop in parallel. You know, we'll see examples of both. But we think in the long run, that second future will dominate, that we'll find new and better ways of solving the sorts of problems that traditionally only professionals have solved. And we argue this will lead to the dismantling of those traditional professions. Now, in response, we anticipated in the book a set of eight objections to that to that claim about the long run. Today, I want to just talk about one of them, which is this trust objection. Uh, and the trust objection goes something like this. It's the idea that without the professions, without doctors and teachers and lawyers and accountants and so on, we will not have alternative trustworthy institutions that are capable of addressing problems and delivering services that are currently handled by the professions. So that's the objection. And we have a couple of responses to this, and, and I wanted to share them with you today. The first is that, just in practice, this isn't true. What we're seeing across the professions are people in institutions that look very unlike traditional professionals, taking on the work of traditional professionals. Let me give you a flavor of some of these. In education, more people signed up for Harvard's online courses in a single year than attended the actual university in its entire existence up until that point. Khan Academy, online collection of practice problems and instructional videos, very high quality resource. I teach economics, and I often direct my students towards it. It has 10 million unique users a month. That's more unique users than the entire school population of England. In medicine, 190 million people uh, use WebMD, an online collection of health websites, extensive guidance on symptoms and treatments. 190 million, that's more than all the visits to traditional doctors working in the United States. Uh, the US Food and Drug Administration has said that by 2018, there'll be at least 1.5 billion people with one or more medical apps on their smartphone. In the world of journalism, 2014, Associated Press started to use algorithms to computerize the production of earnings reports. So using these algorithms, they were able to produce 15 times as many earnings reports as when they relied upon traditional financial journalists alone. In the legal world, on eBay, every single year, 60 million disputes arise, 60 million, and they're resolved online without any traditional lawyers using what's called an e-mediation platform. So just bear in mind, 60 million disputes. That's 40 times the number of civil claims that are filed in the entire English and Welsh justice system. 40 times the number. They're resolved on this one website each year without any traditional professionals. LegalZoom said the best known legal brand isn't a traditional law firm anymore. It is LegalZoom an online document drafting and legal advice platform. World of Tax, 2014, 48 million Americans used online tax preparation software rather than a traditional tax professional to help them. Uh, one of the professions we looked at in the book was divinity. Uh, and, and this is, I think, my favorite uh, example of them all. In 2011, the Catholic Church issued the first ever digital imprimatur. Now, an imprimatur is the official license granted by the Catholic Church to religious texts. Uh, it granted it to this app called Confession, uh, which helps you prepare for confession. So it's, it's got tools for tracking sin, uh, and it's, it's got drop-down panels of options for contrition. Uh, and it, it was very controversial at the time. The issuing of imprimators is decentralized in the Catholic Church, and what happened was a church somewhere in North America issued this imprimator. It caused such a stir, the Vatican itself had to step forward and say, look, 
while you're allowed to use this app to prepare for confession, please remember that it's no substitute for the real thing. So what, what we were seeing across the professions were people and institutions, again, that look quite unlike the traditional professions, solving the sorts of problems that only the traditional professions have solved. The traditional professions will position themselves as trusted advisors. And in that role as trusted advisors, argue that they are the only way to solve the problems that they currently solve. And we say that actually, in an internet society, that's wrong. We're seeing a move away from this idea of a trusted advisor to instead something far more general, which is just a trusted solution. Whether or not it looks like a traditional doctor or teacher, accountant or lawyer, doesn't matter. It's its ability to solve the problem uh, that's put to it. It's often said in response to this, well, look, it's no, that's, that's all very well and good, but there's no guarantee that the people who put their faith in these new systems and institutions won't have that trust betrayed. And our response to this, and it's quite an important one, is that you know, the professions aren't unimpeachable either. You know, solicitors Regulation Authority, 400 full-time members looking for professional misconduct uh, amongst lawyers. General Medical Council, 30 million pounds a year reviewing um, doctors who are accused of uh, not being fit for practice. You know, implicit in that trust objection that I set out at the start, this idea that only the professions, these trusted professions, are capable of solving problems, is this idea that necessarily a division of labor in society, that some people are expert and know things and other people don't, that that division of labor necessarily implies a division of moral behavior as well. And it's simply not true. You know, the fault lines of expertise and good conduct don't lie on top of each other. It's perfectly possible for people outside those traditional professions to act in the sort of way that the professions say that they act. I think the more substantive reason, though, for objecting to the trust objection is this idea that actually in an internet society, trust may be too strong a requirement. So when we use the word trust in everyday conversation, really there are two different conceptions of it. And this is a distinction made by a philosopher called Natalie Gold, and I think it's an important one. A distinction between the idea of trust as reliability and the idea of trust as trustworthiness. So the idea of trust as reliability is that when we say trust, that when we say we trust someone or something, we, expect, uh, we anticipate that it will bef uh, perform as expected. So it's quite a weak form of trust. There's then, of course, a stronger form of trust, which isn't just that we expect something to perform as expected, but we actually make a moral judgment about that person or that thing. You know, we make a judgment. We, we say that their motivations or their character is good or are good uh, alongside the fact that they will perform as expected. And, and just think about it in everyday conversation. We use trust in both those senses. We use it to say we anticipate that something's reliable, but we also use it as a sort of seal of approval on someone or something. Think about if a friend calls you reliable, how much better it feels if that instead they call you trustworthy. You know, there's a sort of moral claim in that as well, moral judgment there. Now, what's interesting about companies like TurboTax, like LegalZoom, like eBay, is that they're providing reliable and effective services. They've got good feedback from users and, and from, their, from consumers of these things, but they're not appealing to that very strong sense of trustworthiness that the professions say is necessary to solve the sorts of problems that they solve. And in actual fact, if you take any lump of professional work and break it down into all its constituent tasks and activities, as is happening across the professions, we're seeing professional work being broken down, many of these tasks can be done in not through a trusted solution, but in fact something even weaker than that, just a reliable solution. You know, that's what LegalZoom uh, TurboTax, eBay's online dispute resolution. That's the sort of thing that they are doing. You know, we call this weaker form of trust that's emerging online quasi-trust. You know, it's, it's confidence in the reliability of a service and the honesty of the provider. But we're not making any claims necessarily. We're not expecting anything about the motivations of the people providing these services. We're not wanting them to be altruistic or other regarding. We're just wanting them to do a good job resolving our problems. And that, I think, is possible for many of the tasks and activities that the, tra uh, that the traditional professions do. What about those remaining tasks? If I go back to that diagram, there were three I left off. Uh, the sorts of things for which trustworthiness, that very strong sense of trust matters. What about those? The traditional response is, well, look, the professions have to handle that. And we say, it's just not, that's not going to happen. Uh, we're going to see very different types of people and institutions trying to handle those tasks and activities too. Sometimes this will involve AI systems, and 
I think this presents a new challenge, uh, and I just want to say a little about this. I want to take you back to uh, what we call a first wave of artificial intelligence. Um, in fact, back to 1980, 1986. Uh, and in 1986, a piece of legislation was passed called the Latent Damage Act. And this is an extract from it. This is the sort of thing you were up against, incredibly complicated. Section two of this act shall not apply to an action to which this section applies. Okay? You know, that's a, that's a more readily understandable piece of the legislation. Very difficult, very difficult to understand how it works. And my co-author in writing The Future of the Professions, who uh, the fact we share a surname isn't a coincidence. He's also my, my dad. Uh, he was doing his doctorate in artificial intelligence and law at the time, and he worked on the development of this. Now, he assures me that this was actually quite a cool screen design. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, but basically, what it was was that the leading expert in the world at the time on the Latent Damage Act, this very complicated piece of legislation, was the dean of the law school at the time in Oxford. And he came to my dad and said, look, it's absurd that any time anyone wants to understand if this legislation applies to them, they have to go uh, not to, uh, th there's no way of finding out apart from coming to me and asking me. And he said, look, why don't we build a system together uh, that non-experts can use? And that's, and that's what they did. It was published in the form of two floppy disks. Uh, this was a time when floppy disks genuinely were floppy. Uh, and essentially what they did together was build a giant decision tree where you answered yes or no questions and, and the, the content here doesn't matter, but you navigated through a giant decision tree. Okay? Answering yes or no questions, the particular tree they built had about four million branches through it. Uh, and the great merit of this approach, where you built these decision trees and built them out of the expertise of a human expert, and that's what my dad was doing. He was sitting down with this human expert, mining the jewels of expertise from his head and representing it in a set of rules for non-experts to use. The great merit of these systems was that, was that they were very transparent. You know, if you wanted to understand a judgment it had made or a particular recommendation that had come out, you could follow the decision tree and follow the reasoning, and it would make complete sense because it was based on human reasoning. And that was what the first wave of AI was all about, building systems out of the expertise of human experts and then making it available in a system for non-experts to use. In 1997, a turning point happened, though. And this was when, as many of you in the room will know, Gary Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue, IBM supercomputer at chess. Now, in the 1980s, my dad and his, his uh, pals working in the computing lab thought this wasn't possible. And they thought it wasn't possible because, at the time, their understanding of how these systems worked was that if you wanted to build a system that could outperform a human expert, you first had to get a human expert to articulate to you how it was they were so good at a task. And then you had to replicate that in a set of rules for a machine to follow. Here's the problem, though. You sit down with Gary Kasparov and say, how is it you're so good at chess? He'll say things like, oh, it's intuition, it's creativity, it's gut reaction. And these things were incredibly difficult to articulate in a set of rules. And so they thought it simply wouldn't be feasible to build a machine uh, to articulate a set of rules for a machine to follow, and so to build a machine that could outperform a human expert. What they hadn't banked on, though, was the explosive growth in processing power that happened since the 1980s. So by the time that Gary Kasparov sat down with Deep Blue, Deep Blue was calculating up to 330 million moves a second. Now, Gary Kasparov, at best, could consider about 100 moves a turn. Now, this machine was, in a sense, playing a different game. It wasn't thinking or reasoning or following rules that reflected the way a human being performed a task. It was relying upon brute force processing power and massive data storage capability. It's a point made by Patrick Winston, one of the uh, founding fathers of artificial intelligence, that there's, there's lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. Uh, and it's an incredibly important idea. That's what was so interesting about, uh, about Deep Blue, the IBM system. It's creating what we call increasingly capable non-thinking machines. Uh, and, and this is what the second wave of AI is about, systems and machines that are outperforming human beings, but not by replicating or understanding the thinking processes of human beings. The consequence of that, though, is that these systems are incredibly opaque. Those first generation systems, based on the reasoning of human beings, very transparent, very easy to explain how it was that particular recommendation came out. These systems, not based on human reasoning, are far, far uh, more difficult to understand. And if we're trying to build trust in these sorts of second generation systems, I think the challenge ahead of us uh, is quite significant. It is hard to trust in something uh, 
that it is very difficult to understand how it works. So three important things there. One, I think what we're seeing in an internet society is a move away from trusted advisors, the idea that if you have a particular medical problem, a particular legal problem, a particular educational problem, you go to a professional, a trusted advisor, and they resolve it. We're seeing a move away from that to something far weaker, that people are interested more and more in simply reliable solutions. The second is we're seeing the emergence of a new type of trust, a new trusting relationship, far weaker than that idea of trustworthiness, and we call this quasi-trust. And secondly, I think there are significant challenges uh, as the second wave of AI starts to seep outside of board games, outside of the chessboard, uh, towards uh, some of the more uh, important problems in our lives. So I will, I will finish there. Uh, and I think that those are the most important things to take away about the, uh, the challenges we face with uh, trust in the professions. Thank you very much.